now modeling the 1983 Neumann U87. Let's bring on Mr. Chase Hughes, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Chase Beautiful Hughes. Beautiful mic. <laughs> Lead into it. Do it. Fine, fine casing. Uh, yeah. Used by everybody from John Lennon to... But static was a bit of a problem with that particular model. I don't think it's something he can't get past right now, Mark. So just in a few minutes, he's going to move on to the Shure SM57, a little bit cheaper than the models. Let's talk about that. Here we go. Hi, I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body. <laughs> I'm about to choke. <laughs> Almost swallowed my gum. I was trying to <laughs> covertly chew an ice cube while you were doing that. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. Chase? Hi, I'm Chase Hughes. Did 20 years in the U.S. military. Published a number one best-selling book on behavioral profiling, reading people, persuasion and influence. And now I develop tactics for intelligence operations and the general public. And I have just written a fiction book, which is right here behind me, called Phrase 7, soon to be a television series. Greg? Yeah, I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written a bunch of books on body language and behavior. Scott and I have a number one body language tactics course. Find us at bodylanguagetactics.com. And I mostly spend my time with corporate America and Wall Street today. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. All right. Well, today we're going to be talking about Amanda Knox. That's a sort of an old case, but we got to looking at it and people kept saying, uh, do this case, do that one. And Amanda came up a lot. So that's what we decided to do. We've got uh, nine videos all together, but we're only going to cover five today. So there will be a part two to this. And uh, I know everybody has a little bit about what they want to say about what we're looking at. Greg, you want to go first? Yeah, and, and I won't steal any thunder from you, Chase, here on some other parts. But guys, this is a messy, messy case. I usually can pick up a case, walk through it, and say, okay, that makes perfect sense. Go read this one. This is a chaotic mess about how it finally ends up. She does a lot of different things in her interrogation where she – writes a statement that looks like a house of mirrors and gives her outs and all those kinds of things. She says that she was coerced. So for us, we thought this was a good one because we can look at body language and we're only go we're going to look at the body language, but I will tell you, you've seen me a lot of times. This one brought out the interrogator in me. I always say I try to be a body language guy, not an interrogator. This one brought out the interrogator. When I watched her, I understand why interrogators chased her like she was running. It, it gets, there's a lot in this video. So I'd, I'd leave, it at that in terms of this video. And I think all of us are going to have a lot to say about Amanda. Chase. Yeah. So one thing I think we get a lot of comments on the video like this. Have you guys not looked at the DNA analysis? We're not the forensics panel. We're the behavior panel. And there's tons of other stuff where people can analyze the forensic data. I'm not an expert. I don't think any of us are. What we're doing here is for education and entertainment so that is just so you can analyze this interview. And what we're going to do is treat what you're about to see as if this is the only evidence that we were ever presented. So we're not going to take into account anything else. So we're going to pretend like we're the ones who watch this video right after everything happened and show you our opinions and what we would say if this was all we had. Yeah. And Chase, can I add one thing back to that? I think what you just said is important. And what we're not saying is she's guilty or innocent. What we're saying is this is what I see. And if I were an interrogator sitting across the table from her, what would I go after? Right. Exactly. Mark, Mark, you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Simply that I've never seen uh, this person before. I have seen no other interviews with her. All I got was the, that particular interview from uh, Scott. And I looked at that and then afterwards went, Scott, who's this? What, what's, what's happening here? So I literally looked at this fresh with no context at all. That could be a good thing. That could be a bad thing, or it could be nothing. But I'm just letting you know my situation in this. I think, I think it's going to be a good thing because it's going to show, right, you know, how you can see something and very quickly break it down. So that's, of course, Mark being the guy, we usually, I like to say, Mark, for the end of these things sometimes, because he just wraps everything up. We always talk about that behind your back, Mark, just so you know. How you wrap everything up so it sounds, so it makes us sound smart. <laughs> but uh, so well, that's, There's also that, the hammer and nail thing. Three of us are hammers. 
Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. three of us are interrogators. So if you turn to run, we go after you. And Mark, yeah. you don't do that. And I think it's a good, it's a good balance for us. And I, and I agree with you, Greg, because as, as you know, because we spoke about this earlier, as soon as I, I've watched some of the things like whenever this happened a few years ago, I was like, oh, she lied or tell the truth. And on this, my everything came out. Every little thing came out. I went, holy smokes. This is, there's a lot of uh, questionable stuff going on here. And you're right. When she starts running, it's, it's hard not to chase. But I think whoever's, whoever's interviewing her, man, they didn't say a word. They did. They, it was, it was perfect. You know, it was excellent. They asked a question to shut up. So that was, that was really, that was, that's what we're going for. It's beautiful. You know? Yeah. All right. So let's get started and let's, oh, and as we go through this, remember, we're not, we're, we're not doing politics, but on this, we're not saying somebody's guilty. We're not saying somebody's innocent. We're going to show you if we say, I see what looks like deception. And it looks like it's here, here, and here. And then we'll show you why. If we say, we look, we're seeing truth. And here's what the truth looks like here. It's here, here, and here. So that's what we're seeing. And again, we, we're not going through all the evidence. We're not doing all that. We're just showing you what we're seeing in these videos, period. That's it. All right. Ready? Here we go. Um, I, when I first went in, um, it was very strange to me. Um, and I didn't know what to think because, yes, the front door was open, but everything looked normal. Everything that I saw just in walking in the front door, going to my bedroom, and going to the bathroom, the various bathrooms, everything looked completely normal. So I did not think there's been a break in. Um, I just thought, okay, well, the door doesn't work very well, so maybe someone didn't close it all the way. Mm -hmm. And then once I saw the blood in the bathroom, um, I and the and the feces in the toilet, I thought, okay, well. That's really weird. Um, first of all, the blood in the bathroom, like it wasn't a lot. So I didn't, I didn't assume that someone had been murdered. <laughs> I, um, I assumed that either someone kind of hurt themselves or there was menstrual issues um, and, and they hadn't been cleaned up. And so I thought, okay, well maybe somebody ran out really quickly and is coming back. Um, maybe someone went downstairs into the apartment below. I didn't know, but when okay. So here I'm gonna I'm gonna go first this time. Here's here's the way it looks to me. One of the first things she says is, "I went in and everything looked normal, but it felt but it was strange to me." She's telling you one thing, but she's coming back the other way with something else. Then she talks about how when she goes through the house, when she she, she comes home, the door is open. First thing you do when you when you come home, the door is open. You call the cops. You don't go in. That's the last thing you want to do, especially if you're a girl by yourself. You don't go in the house. The person could still be in there or the people could still be in there. Um, and she starts what I'm going to call and keep referring to her as her campaign of confusion about how confused she is in all these things, how she doesn't understand what's happening. We're going to see literally a campaign of that as we go through this, as we go through this story. Um, and when she talks about, when she says it was very strange to me and everything looked normal, it's like lyrics from a Sticks album, you know, the Pieces of Eight or one of those things from back in the 70s. It's just, it's just weird. And then when she goes in, she doesn't call out to anybody. She doesn't say, hey, Meredith, hey, uh, any of the other girls, right? Is anybody here? Is it just, you know, what's going on? Everybody, everybody okay? She doesn't do that. She goes back to her bedroom and to two bathrooms. She goes to both bathrooms in the house. Who's going to do that? So that was odd. And then she says she found blood in one bathroom and feces in the other in the blood. She said, oh, it, could be, it could be a menstrual situation with, for women. But when that happens, you're going to say, ah, oh, come on. And you may leave it or may, depending on what kind of person you are, you may clean it up, whatever. But when you go to the other bathroom and there's feces in there in the commode, you're not going to be creeped out. You're going to be yucked out. It's going to be disgusting. And you're going to flush it. And you're going to say, who's the pig? That's the first thing you're going to think. And you're going to think since it's a house full of girls, I would think I'm not a girl, so I don't know. But they're going to say so-and-so had somebody over or somebody's been here, some guy, and did that and didn't flush it. So you're going to flush it. That's I mean, Come on. I don't think she's an animal, but she should, you know, I would assume she'd flush it. Then she says, um, I didn't assume anyone had been murdered. That's her first laugh. And that's the first time we see her body language sort of almost explode into a lot of movement and stuff as her hand goes almost above her head and her head, her head goes back and we see um, she laughs and her head pushes forward as she's looking to get that 
to sort of try to bond with, with that person, get them to listen as in, right, right, to get that acceptance and request for approval, which is Greg uh, has um, coined that. That's when the eyebrows go up and you say something, hoping that person will okay that and agree with you. So we see that. We see the request for approval. And then, and I, I think I'll get some pushback from uh, Greg and Chase on this as well, because uh, we're talking about eye movement, where, where her eyes are going and where she's looking. Now, there's a thing, and I, I thought about whether I was going to say this or not on here, because that's one of the things I like to use. I don't want anybody to watch this and go, that's that dude, and here's what he's going to do, here's what he's looking for. This is something I call the safe, uh, allowing safe critique, where she's talking, and she starts talking about how strange things are, but she looks down, and then she starts talking about how weird it is, because when you're talking to someone, when someone asks you a question and you're answering their question, you're looking at them. And we have this, this social bond. I'm going to look at you while you're talking to me because if I look around, it's going to be weird. I'll maybe look pervy or whatever it's going to be. I'm going to look at you right in the eyes while you're telling me with that. I'm not going to look at you. So she looks down and allows this safe critique to happen of her body language as she starts telling her story. And then her head goes up or her chest comes out a little bit. And her head goes up almost like she's a little child as she starts telling. Every time she starts talking about it, it's strange and she allows this safe critique, which we'll see a couple of times. Um, then we're going to see you see what's called a mini sync throughout this story. We have tons of little stories all around it. There, there, there are just little things going on all around this storyline as it goes forward. There's a guy named Yuri Hassan. He was at Princeton. I'm still there. And he did um, uh, some research. And what his, what his main research thing, thing became famous for was this thing called the brain sync. And what, what he did was this, that he, there was a Russian woman. He had a friend of his come in to where they're doing the studies and he put her in an fMRI machine, and they clocked they watched her brain. They recorded where her brain looked as she told a story. He said, "Tell a story." And while she told the story, they recorded the audio of it while it's recording what her brain is doing as well, right? So while this is going on, um, then he has her tell it in Russian, same story in Russian, and they record what's happening in the brain, they record what's happening um, audio-wise. There's that. Then they bring in different people. Other, they bring in students, I believe, to be the test subjects. And what they do is they put them in the fMRI machine and they play them the audio of the Russian woman telling the story in English. And as she's telling it, certain parts of her brain light up. When she talks about colors, some part of her brain lights up. She talks about um, being somewhere or feeling something, another part of her brain will light up. So when they put the, the other people in the fMRI as well and then played them the audio of her telling the story, the same things would happen to their brain. When, her, when she talked about color, a specific part of her brain would light up. The same part of that person listening, their brain would light up. You'd start talking about feeling something, something kinesthetic. That part of their brain would light up. And this went on for, I think it was 12 minutes. I don't know why I think it's 12 minutes, but I believe that was the time. Did this to a bunch of people, right? Then they, as they did that, the first thing they did was play in the English version. Then they played the Russian version. When they played the Russian version, Nothing happened. The same parts that didn't, didn't light up. It was other things that happened. And they were different for each person because they're not following the story. Now, when those parts of the brain start lighting up together, the two different brains, that's when he calls it a brain sync. That's when they're locked together and they're going through the, the story together. That's why when you're helping someone pitch or teaching someone to pitch their idea, their concept to sell to, or to get funding, you want them to do this, tell a story because it locks that person in with you and they start living that with you. You see it in movies where everybody jumps up at the same time because they've seen somebody not just jump out of the closet, but they're getting ready to and everybody starts getting all fired up for that. So what she's doing is what I call the mini sync. With these small stories, she starts off and she gets a tiny little sync going with you, tell you something then stop and then going forward. Although it's part of this big story that she's telling. And we see these things called, and you see cons do this constantly. That's why I'm... I'm Y'all know my fascination with cons and psychopaths. Cons and psychopaths will do this to get your attention, to get you to bond with them really, really quickly. That's one of the, that's one of the keys to, to getting somebody to give you money, to fall for something. That's one of the biggies is the mini sink. I don't know if it's been named before, but that's what, that's what I'm calling it. But we see those as we go, as we go throughout this big sink of the story. Now, um, I'll stop there. I can keep going and going. But so much. Yeah, there's tons of it. Chase, what do you got? At the risk of making this sound at the intro, like a college lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about a study here, but only to set you up, we, I promise we're not going to do this the whole video. 
<laughs> but there is a great study by Greenberg, Stone, and Wortman at the State University of New York. And this, they took 70 people and they were wondering if writing about falsified traumas or made up stories, it was therapeutic. So as the control group, they took 70 people who had real, who experienced real traumas, had them write a couple sentences about it and describing it or a couple paragraphs. Then they took 70 more people and had them write something else. They had them write a fake trauma, something that was invented. And it was shocking that they found in the results, they could tell based on what word choices these people used, which statements were false and which one were accurate with about 95, 99% accuracy just on word choice. Now, what happens here is when you're retelling a story, it occurs in three-dimensional space. So, as we go through this video, listen to see if, if, if there's a real three-dimensional space being described or a fabricated memory. Another thing that happens is emotional telling, and there's an overuse of verbs. If I, my dad died, I'm going to tell you my dad died. But if you make up the story, you're going to have to first think, how would I feel? Now, think about this. I'll have to describe my feelings using more verbs. But if I say that my dad died, me being sad is implicit. Me trying to fake it, I would want to think first, I'm reliving the story so the verbs will come out more because I'm experiencing it live with you. But if it's a traumatic event, it's over, and I'm, I'm just retelling an event. But a made-up story, I'm experiencing it live in the moment, and I'm embellishing a little bit with extra verbs. There's a couple other things that we'll touch on throughout the video, but I want to prep everybody for that at the beginning because it's really important to listen to the word choices here. Does it occur in three-dimensional space? Are we seeing an overuse of verbs? And there's a lowered use of self-reference pronouns, which would be I, me, and my throughout the story, which is indicative of deception. And that's been proven beyond a doubt in a lot of these statement analysis. And if you want to look this up, there's a book called The Secret Life of Pronouns by Dr. James Pennebaker. He is the head psychologist at the University of Texas at Austin. Great guy. And the only thing I'll say about the video, which I haven't yet, she says, and then once I went to the bathroom, so there's some missing time there, which I first learned in my life probably seven years ago from actually one of Greg's books. So appreciate it. And I'll pass it on to Mark since we got picked on for picking Mark last in the comments a few videos. <laughs> okay. Uh, so look, here's, here's what I notice about it. And uh, I, I was noticing this around her, her confirmation glances that she does and the eyebrow raises that happen again I think they're around confirmation are you with me are you with me on this story so I looked on this first one into what is the how is she telling the story and here's what I noticed about it she will tell us what she saw first of all which I would be used to that in terms of a first recount of a story look here's what happened this happened this happened this happened that's what we call in a story plot the things that happen so she gives us the thing that happens and then she goes into the process that her thinking goes through yeah so she goes now here's here's my cognition around that and then she goes into and because of that, here's what I assume was the situation. And then out of that, she goes, so here's what I did. Now, this is quite complex storytelling, which makes me think she's constructed this way of telling the story because of a question that gets asked her about this or some of the ideas that people already have about the story. So here's me watching this for the first time and I'm going, so this is a kind of an odd way to tell a story because it feels to me like she's already constructed this to have an outcome in mind, which is opposite to the, to the question being asked or, or a feeling that would, somebody would have about this. Essentially, she's constructing a, a logic, I would say, around a specific 
outcome which is in antagonism to the question that she's being asked or the assumptions or feelings or thoughts others would have. So in my mind, I instantly go, so we're probably a good distance away from when this thing happened. Or certainly, we're a good distance away from it, and others already have their idea mapped out of what went on there, and she's trying to change that opinion that's going on and say, look, here's why I did what I did, because here's the assumption that I made, because here's what I was thinking at the time, because here's what I saw. So your antagonism against why I did what I did it's not, not logically accurate. Here's the logic we have to play. Your ideas about this are not logically accurate. Now, when I watched this, I had no idea why. I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, I just go, I just go, so this is a well thought out way of telling a story when somebody has decided already what they think of it. Just, just that. I want to give you one more thing that I think is interesting around this. When she says the word murdered, she does a smile of fear. Yeah, she does that movement. Okay, it's kind of a smile. She shows a bit of teeth, and these come, come down. It's often called the smile of, it has a fear element to it. I don't know whether that's what she's feeling at the time, but it's a, it's a big gesture. And just as a, an odd piece of information for you that I found out just last week, is 40% of people on the planet do not have the muscles to be able to do that one. That astonished me. And this was from a, a facial scientist, somebody who deals only in the face and the science around the face. So I found that extraordinary. I don't have the data to back that up, but I'm taking it as accurate from the person who spends all their time doing that and looking at that. That's, that's a gesture that not everybody can do. In my understanding, that means there is some fear in the in that smile. So if you were looking for the smile of a of somebody who has committed a terrible act, it may not be that pleasure in the act, it's the fear in the idea or around the idea of murder. There. That's my that's my bit on that first piece there. So I'll try to keep this as short as I can, but this one is loaded with lots of things that would make an interrogator go down the path of thinking she's guilty. Let's start with number one. When she first starts off, the story, Mark, this whole point of storytelling, if you happened across a little bit of blood and then you later discovered more blood, you would not say, you wouldn't tell it like that. You would say, hey, I first found a few drops of blood. Later, I learned there's a big footprint full of blood when I got out of the shower. People don't control release stories that they're trying to give you all the information on. So that's a red flag if you're an interrogator, you go after that. At about 15 seconds, she makes normal eye contact and then it drifts off from there. Most of the rest of her eye contact will be internal conversation, down, concentrating, emotion, feeling, back up to make eye contact with the request for approval. Those are red flags when you're walking through. I'm going to give you one red flag that I noticed throughout this entire video. And every time it comes up, I'm going to point it out. It happens six times. If it just happens six times randomly, no big deal. But it happens every time there's something that could be an emotional issue. She does a very deep swallow. She does it in this case at 27 seconds. I did not think there was a break in. Deep swallow and immediate down left internal conversation. It, it comes up again and again and again. And it's around things that could be emotional issues. Those are, Chase always say, I'm obsessed with baseline. If you bang your head into a wall enough times, it means something. So I start paying attention. And then you start building your story and how you would interrogate it by hitting those key points that are at emotional times when she takes a deep swallow is how I would interrogate her. So she walks through this. She talks about the blood in the bathroom. There's a mutt, and you, you really have to pay attention. At 39 seconds into the video, she has a micro expression of disgust when she talks about the blood. Now she goes on and on and on about how disgusted she is with the, with the feces in the toilet, but little about the blood, but there's clearly a disgust uh, micro expression here. There's also a lot of discussion and then there's a little bit of something going on in her face around contempt if you stop the video when she's talking about the, the feces piece, because there's a, her face is not symmetric at that point. And that's usually associated with, with contempt. Um, she does 
throughout here, and I think you called it um, fishing for resonance or request for approval, she'll tilt her head and drag you toward her with her eyes. That's fishing for resonance to see if you're buying into the story and continuing down the path. Um, she didn't assume somebody was murdered. Mark, I think that's the best catch of the day is that nervous smile, that fear smile. You don't see that smile normally. If you slow this video down or pause it when you get to that point, you'll see some fantastic ones there. And then she's got request for approval, request for approval. There are so many pieces where she's trying to drag you into her storytelling. Given this is many years after, she's trying to drag you into her storytelling. It makes an interrogator's hair stand up and want to go after her. And realize, like I said, this is interrogator looking. This is not what you usually hear from me. This is not Tom Reed where I'm talking to a guy about a 50-year-old memory and a story as a nine-year-old. This is a person who is being questioned for murder. And imagine as an interrogator, all of these red flags came out day one. Well, you can imagine why they suspicious, they're suspicious. they suspicious of her right there. And there's a lot of shoulder. We'll leave those for later because it comes up a lot more. But watch for that deep swallow. This is number one of six. We'll go from there. Thanks, Scott. Um, I... When I first went in, um, it was very strange to me. Um, and I didn't know what to think because yes, the front door was open, but everything looked normal. Everything that I saw just in walking in the front door, going to my bedroom and going to the bathroom, the various bathrooms, everything looked completely normal. So I did not think there's been a break-in. Um, I just thought, okay, well, the door, doesn't work very well, so maybe someone didn't close it all the way. Mm -hmm. And then once I saw the blood in the bathroom, um, I and the and the feces in the toilet, I thought, okay, well that's really weird. Um, first of all, the blood in the bathroom, like it wasn't a lot, so I didn't I didn't assume that someone had been murdered. Mm -hmm. I um, I assumed that either someone kind of hurt themselves, or there was menstrual issues um, and, and they hadn't been cleaned up. And so I thought, okay, well maybe somebody ran out really quickly and is coming back. Um, maybe someone went downstairs into the apartment below. I didn't know. But when Excellent. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's move on. Below, I didn't know. But when I saw the feces in the toilet, it actually creeped me out. Um, because that was just very unusual. And so I left feeling creeped out. <laughs> um, I locked the door and I left and I went back to Raphael's and I kept brooding over it. He was in the bathroom and, and brooding over it. Um, I had brought a mop from my place because there was water on the floor in the kitchen. His pipe had gone loose. Um, and so I was doing that. I was mopping that up. And immediately after he got out of the shower, I was like, tell me if I'm crazy, Raphael. <laughs> like, what what do I do about this? Um, and he immediately was alarmed and was like, no, you have to call your roommates, figure out what happened. Something happened. Um, and so I, I tried to call Meredith. Her phone didn't answer. I tried to call Philomena. Um, well, actually, I tried to call Laura, and her phone didn't answer. Then I called Philomena finally. Um, and, um, and she was very alarmed by it. Um, she said that she hadn't been home that night, she had been out at the party, and that I should go and check it out. And so I thought, okay, but I'm gonna go with Raphael. And so we were gathering ourselves and- All right, Mark, you wanna go first this time? Yeah, sure. So I wanna reiterate again, the, the structure of her storytelling, for me at the moment, is the structure that you would create if you knew already the objections that you're dealing with. So she's, she's created something which deals now, I would suggest, with all the objections she's heard in the past, like, well, why, how, why did you have a mop? Like, what was, so hang on, so you went back home and you were, there was a mop and like you, somebody was having a shower and so were you, were you, who was having a shower? Like, why? Why did you have a, have a shower? So, so that's just interesting for me, just as a new viewer to this, my mind goes, why that structure? Why do you need that structure right now? So it, it fires off for me, something's going on here around the, the story that she's telling is designed to deal with objections, not designed to tell you what happened, I would suggest. Um, okay, when we see her talk about feces in the toilet, uh, we get we get the disgust, distaste in the mouth. 
where the sides of the if you get a if you get a, a lemon and you suck a lemon the sides of your mouth back here will do a certain action if you get a bitter herb of some sort and and you chew on that the moment it hits the back the alkaloids hit the hit the back here you'll get that bitterness and that's to let you know there's something especially if you were very small as a child there's something going into your mouth that at that age may not be good for you may not be good medicine and we keep that bitter feeling or that distaste gesture so something is distasteful uh, around around this well it's feces in the toilet so you know we, we can get as as to why but again creeped out we get that smile of fear uh again there can't quite do it but there uh again tricky what the reason i bring up that this idea of of 40 percent of people maybe can't do that well that means you if that's true you haven't had a lot of chance to mirror that not only do you not see it a lot but a lot of people don't do it so when it does get done it's notable it's really special when you see somebody do that gesture in fact if you look at the animations of a guy called nick parks uh who produced things like wallace and gromit i don't know whether you've come across those british cartoons uh, wallace and gromit will often do that gesture a lot because it's so extreme. It's so extreme to see the smile of fear uh, that it gets a lot of attention from our instinct. So again, just want to put that one out there. Uh, the most important thing is we're seeing a story here which is designed to deal with, to countermeasure objections, I would say. Uh, Greg, let's go to you. What do you got? Sure, yeah. She makes an overly big deal about feces in the toilet. And this, there's a really odd thing that you don't see very often. Her bright brow rises at the same time the right side of her mouth draws down. At, before she gets to the smile of terror, that's about 10 or 11 seconds, she does a smile of fear or terror. Again, you're going to see a handful of things. Deep swallow immediately. Breaks eye contact to, down into the left, and her lips go into a sm slight smile after all of that big deal about feces. Now, by this point... She already knows in real life, not at this point in the story about the feces, she knows there's a bloody footprint on the rug. Hmm. Maybe there's some relation there. I, as I walk through this, and there's a red flag. You hit one of them just a few minutes ago, Chase. She says, and so I left, feeling creeped out. And so is a time-hiding device. You know, age-old thing. What did you do, Mr. Johnson? I went to see my ex-wife. I gave her the alimony and I left. Never mind, he backed over with a car in that process. He leaves that time out with and then. And so. She does say and so fairly often in here. So it may or may not be a red flag as you listen. It's just a speech pattern. But she has a few red flag moments. That around that whole making such a big deal about the toilet while there's still blood in the room and those pieces and then doing the whole smirk, grimace, smile, whatever you want to call it. Her, her body language, this mop thing, tells me it's a redirect. It's some way to take more detail of the story. She edits as she moves. And I, I think you're right, Mark. I read that it became an issue. They tested it for DNA and all that, and there was nothing on it. However, it became an issue for her, so she has to point it out. It's also a really good way for her to take pressure off of her story here. And then at 57 seconds, she swallows again as she corrects herself about a misstatement about who she called first, second, or third. So around feces, red flag two. Around correcting her statement, red flag three with a swallowing. So you wonder what kind of baggage there is. Maybe there's been something emotional around not flushing the toilet in the past. Who knows? It starts to get me to say, hmm, wonder what's going on in the house and what kind of emotional baggage these people have. Now that's interrogator 101. You start looking for indicators when there's a red flag. So again, hammer and nail. Then finally around 106, she starts to do something she shouldn't do when she's telling a story. And that's when she's talking about something negative, she shakes her head. She's talking about something positive, she nods. That will come up again later. And you see at 110, she shakes, she nods, yes. And at 106, she's shaking her head. Patterns. Now we're starting to see patterns. We're getting a good baseline for who she is. I think I'll stop right there, hand that off to Chase, and go from there. So I get to say, Chase, what do you got? <laughs> All right. Uh, I went to Raphael's, and he was in the bathroom. Who cares? 
if, if any of us, I mean, we've all heard stories. We've all asked people about things that they've been through. I think uh, I'm, I'm fairly young, but I've hit around the 20,000 hour mark on this kind of stuff. People don't tell stories like this, period. Uh, so that was extremely unusual. Uh, I brought a mop from my place. His pipe had gone loose, which is a little strange. I'm, I'm in fear for my life. I maybe, maybe not should call the police. There might be someone who broke into my house. But let me grab this mop so I can uh, clean up your kitchen uh, while we talk about it. thought that was a little weird. And like Mark said, this is a, a, a detail that helps you – if we're talking about what Scott did with the fMRI, and I've got a brain here, if I'm getting a little suspicion of electricity in this part of the brain, and then I have to start thinking about a mop, I'm, I'm redirecting resources. And that's not something, she's not sitting there reading textbooks on how to lie. But that's something we do naturally. We'll redirect stories. And I don't understand how she says, I tried calling, what was the victim's name? Meredith. Meredith. I tried calling Meredith and her phone didn't answer, which was unusual. And I think automatically suggests that she knew the person couldn't and the phone did not either. I thought that was an unusual turn of phrase there. And I think, again, we're seeing gaps in time all over the place, but we're seeing if I had experienced all of this, how would I feel? And that becomes part of the story. So people are talking, like, even if it's something bad that happened to you, you going through a car crash, you're not going to say the car in front of me slammed on the brakes and it terrified me. I was very scared. And then I hit the brakes. That doesn't happen. We don't describe things like that, even traumatic events. So we're seeing this start to build up to a, a highly, dare I say, deceptive level. And I'll but Chase, one, one note to add back to what you just said. One of the things in my past life we would do is have men and women write statements and about true events. And what we did find is that women would talk about feelings more than men would. We would say, I was in a crash, glass flew, hit me in the head. Uh, I got a cut and a woman might say, I got a cut in my face and I was terrified. I was afraid, you know, things that you and I would not say or, you know, and, and it's a bell curve. I always have to remind people when I talk about men or women or anyone else, it's a bell curve. But yeah, you do find some nuance to those statements, but I think you're dead on. You don't say, and then I was afraid that I might have a scar on my face. No, that's not how people talk. Yeah. And I think women do use a lot more emotion and descriptive, but not in this in right. this way, I, I do agree with you, for so, sure. So further to that point, again, what we're seeing here is here's what I saw. Here's the process that I went through around seeing that. So here was my assumption. So here was my action. And she may well name the feeling. And then she displays a feeling. So she goes through that pattern. Again, that, that for me is, is, is notable. It's a very notable way of, of getting to end with a strong feeling in, in, in two of the cases here, the feeling of, of, the, of terror and, dis, and get to display that right at the end. Okay. All right. Here's what I'm seeing. Uh, now I'm going to go get a little bit against uh, you and Greg, Chase, when it comes to the, the uh, feces in the commode and Mark as well. Um, I think what we're seeing there, we're not seeing disgust because I went back over this a lot. And what we're seeing is contempt, I believe, because we only see the one part pull up over here, especially when she, every time she, not every time, but you see a much smaller one that we would argue over the second time she talks about the feces. But the first time she, uh, we see contempt because I think she knows who did that. And I think that's, she doesn't like that person. That's why I see that one little pop right there. If you'll, I'll, I'll put this back in there so you can see where it is. Because that was just very unusual. Because that was just very unusual. That's why I think it's not uh, discussed. I think it's contempt and she, because she knows who did that. And she's, she doesn't, she's angry because that person is such an idiot to do something like that. She, she looks down on that person, I would think, in that situation. Um, 
Also after that, she laughs. And that's the second laugh. That's laugh number two we have in this. When we're talking about a murder, she's laughing in this when she's been asked about her part in what, what happened around a murder, given way too many details. Then everyone who's into true crime has been waiting for one of us to say this, if they've watched these videos before we watch this. And they're going to tell you, and you see the classic setup of, I went back and so and me and so and so went back and we found the body because you're going to, you go back and well I just happened to be in the bathroom and he was in the in the bedroom in the kitchen where the body he found the body in the kitchen we found it I didn't just find it we found it so I'm not I, I, it's not like I so you don't get the idea I killed him and then called him look what I found we went and called him so that separates you from a lot of separation going on here and I got a question for you in a second Chase a lot of separation from from what's actually happening there. Um, it's, it's the next video, Chase. Where I'm, where I'll talk to you about that. Now, um, then, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, she brings up this thing about the mop, and she brings it up just, just though it's just, just a throwaway. For example, the way she says it, it was I got the mop because he had the the pipe that came loose, and that it's like saying, like if you're buying a new house, and the person says to you. This house is great. You're going to love it. There's a park out there for the kids to play in. There's no running water. The park, the cars will park right here in that three car garage. is fantastic. And you totally see, they tell you there's no running water, but it's just like, it's nothing. It just goes right on. That's what I'm seeing here. Greg, we talk about uh, when you do like um, a micro interview on something like that, when it comes up. Yeah. Yeah. So a micro interview is nothing more than I'm having a conversation with you and it's going dent, 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 and your baseline is fairly normal. And suddenly I see something blip up. Scott, you call it loping. Bump, 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 bump. I see in the sine wave a rise, something is wrong. Well, guess what we're going to talk about now? Nothing but whatever caused the rise. And then we'll talk until you blip again. And then I'll expand it and we'll only talk about that. So when there's an and then, for example, I'm talking to you and you say, hey, I was at Scott's house and then I went, okay, well, hold on. Let's talk about the end then. And then you say, well, you know, I went out to my car, I put the keys in and then, oh, well, hold on. Let's talk about end then again. So micro interview is focusing on any time you see a red flag, any of these things, the swallow, I would stop her right there and start talking to her. This would be a very uncomfortable conversation if you're – facing an interrogator because all those pregnant things that we're seeing, they may mean nothing, but you're certainly going to find out you open and open and open until you find all the details. Excellent. Now also she's the only one that, that doesn't get alarmed during all this. She'll call people on the phone and they're freaked out and alarmed. She talks to uh, her boyfriend. He's alarmed. Everybody's alarmed, but her, she's confused She's going along her campaign of not understanding what's happening. I'm confused. I don't get it. I don't understand what's happening here. Separating herself further and further from what's going on and her understanding of, of what's happening here. Um, the fullest expression we've gotten so far is when she, when her boyfriend says something happened and her eyes go really wide and she pulls her head back. So that tells me she's also, that's a shock to me when he said something's happened. I still didn't understand that still going down that road for a campaign of confusion where I don't understand what's happening. I don't get it. I don't, I don't see what's going on here. So um, that's, I'll cut there since we're going long. Hello. I didn't know, but when I saw the feces in the toilet, it actually creeped me out um, because that was just very unusual. And so I left feeling creeped out. <laughs> um, I locked the door and I left and I went back to Raphael's and I kept brooding over it. He was in the bathroom and, and brooding over it. Um, I had brought a mop from my place because there was water on the floor in the kitchen. His pipe had gone loose. Um, and so I was doing that. I was mopping that up. And immediately after he got out of the shower, I was like, tell me if I'm crazy, Raphael. <laughs> like, what, what do I do about this? Um, and he immediately was alarmed and was like, no, you have to call your roommates, figure out what happened. Something happened. Um, and so I, I tried to call Meredith, her phone didn't answer. I tried to call Philomena, um, well actually I tried to call Laura and her phone didn't answer. Then I called Philomena finally. Um, and, um, and she was very alarmed by it. Um, she said that she hadn't been home that night, she had been out at the party, and that I should go and check it out. And so I thought, okay, but I'm gonna go with Raphael. And so we were gathering ourselves and- Is everybody good? Good. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Here we go. We were gathering ourselves and we went back to my apartment. And 
I was already feeling very creeped out. Um, I was like clutching to Raphael. Um, and we were looking around and we actually opened Philomena's door and that's when we noticed the, the window was broken. So I immediately thought, oh my God, there's been a break in. And I started running around. I went, I went into the, um, the other bedroom, which was Laura's, mm -hmm. but it was spotless. Like nothing had been touched. Her bedspread was pulled like so wonderfully clean, mm -hmm. um, like a like a hotel. Like she was a very she was a clean clean person, um, which is why it struck me so strongly that in her bathroom of all places there would be feces left in the toilet. I was like, no, Laura's the clean one. <laughs> so um, so her bedroom was fine, which struck me as very odd because it's like. If, if someone breaks in, like, they're not going to worry about ruffling things up. And indeed, like, Philomena's room was ruffled up. There was clothes and things toppled over and drawers pulled open. And then her room was untouched. The main room, like the kitchen and that area where there was a stereo, there was a TV, untouched. Um, my room, which obviously was not as medicinally clean as Laura's, but... Un, like as far as I could see, untouched, and and then there was Meredith's room. Um, her door was locked, mm -hmm. and that was strange. Um, All right, so uh, Greg, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, right at the start, she's starting to build drama now. She was not creeped out before, but now she's creeped out. What was where is that? Her exact words is she's starting to feel. I forget the exact words. She's starting to show drama now. She's building up a dramatic build. Chase, she starts to use weird words again. I was clutching Raphael, right? She says, I was clutching Raphael. And then she does an odd downright droop of the mouth. It makes me immediately think something is up with that. Whatever that, why that's added, I have no idea. Oh, she was freaked out is the term she used. Um, she's shaking her head no when she said we were gathering ourselves, which is not what I expect. It makes me wonder, is this out of sequence really far in how this whole thing worked? And, at, and then into the thing, she starts some pupil dilation, a little bit of pupil dilation as she fishes for resonance. You really have to pay attention, but if you go back and look, it's at 51 seconds. Her pupils lightly dilate as she's fishing for resonance from the person she's talking to, meaning I'm trying to make connection back to your storytelling point early in this game that where you're talking about sinking, she's looking for that sink in the person. You can see it in her eyes. Here again, we're going to start to see a couple of other red flags. There was a swallow at 43 seconds when she says she was a clean person. And then she goes down and to the right to an emotional accessing cue. So, hmm, creeped out by the feces, um, story correction, now about the person being a clean person. I'm starting to think, okay, I'm going to poke on her and say, did you guys have baggage about housekeeping and, 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 because I guarantee you something's going on there. Doesn't mean she killed this girl. Doesn't mean any of that, but it gives me an insight into something going on in her head. She gets down to where she's talking about Philomena's room and Philomena's room became kind of a, a mop, if you will. It was a redirect. It's a chance for her to talk about something that's not stressful. And then at about a minute and 19 seconds in, she starts to narrate with her left hand instead of her right hand, when she talks about a broken window and those kinds of things. And then at a minute 38, she swallows again when she says Meredith's room was locked. There's a heavy swallow. You'll see this again as we start up the next one. But that's what I've got for this video. And... Scott, did you cover the book? All right. No, not yet. So, um, again, we hear her creating these qualifiers that show she doesn't understand what's happening and how she's afraid. She's not alarmed, but she's starting to, starting to, to, to get freaked out because um, of what's going on. She says, I was clutching Raphael. Well, because she's afraid. She doesn't know what's happened. That's, again, is part of that campaign of, of I don't understand what's happening. Um, and she says, I have no idea what's uh, what's going on or what's happening. Uh, then she gets all animated when she's talking about the uh, details of the other bedrooms. That's when her eyes get all wide. And she starts um, talking about how clean and antiseptic one of the rooms are and hers isn't as clean as the other room. All the while, nobody's checked. Is anybody home? Well, that girl's door's locked. That didn't come up yet. What's going, what's, going, what's going on? She's seeing what's been stolen because now she's decided there's been a break, uh, there's been a break in. And, uh, 
And once she decides that and sees the window, she doesn't say, oh, hey, man, there's been a, somebody's gotten in here. Let's call the cops. No. She, they start searching for the, Again, they start searching for things. You don't want to do that. If you come home, the door's open. You think it's been robbed. You've been robbed. Or somebody's, they could still be in there. Get the hell out of there. Then, uh, again, she brings up the, the, the feces in the toilet thing. And again, you'll see that, that micro expression of contempt. She knows who did that. She knows whose that was. And again, why didn't she flush it? I mean, really? Two questions. She's going to ask, who's the pig? And then, then you know, why don't I flood? Why don't I take care of it? She would go ahead and have done that. It wouldn't have been an, been an issue. Um, yeah, and, she, and then she pretends still that what was in the commode belonged to one of her roommates. So she was the clean one. I know it wouldn't have been her. She's totally not even taking into account someone else, a, a friend of, of one of the other girls could have left it there, you know? And then we see laugh number three. So that's three laughs in the middle of, of talking about uh, a murder you were involved with or you, that you, you happened in your home where you lived. And uh, at the end of this, we'll get into the next video. She starts again to allow another safe critique. So that's what we're seeing when she starts looking down, talking about how strange it was. So Chase, what do you got? Why is this poop such a big deal? It just, I, it's, the, it's the main recurring theme in a murder. Yeah. And it's, it's as if she is Papa Bear coming home and finding this chair has been moved. Somebody's been eating our porridge. Something is amiss. There's someone upstairs sleeping in Baby Bear's bed. And that's, that's what it sounds like to me. And I'm just kind of borrowing from Mark. That's good, <laughs> man. That's great. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. I think it, there's some very unusual pausing initially which people telling an experience don't do. You don't hear that. There's unusual pausing and stopping to think about what she's saying and creeped out, clutching. I was like clutching to Raphael. She's trying to show instead of tell, which is a great storyteller's piece of advice. And we actually opened Philerma, Philomera, Philomera's Philomena. door. Philomena. Philomena. I can't read my own handwriting. We actually opened that door instead of we opened this door. So now she's shifted from self pronoun to team pronouns as the crime scene is starting to be discovered. But even then clutching to her boyfriend, she goes back to describe herself in self pronouns running heroically around this house, making a search, even though she's terrified clutching to her boyfriend. Now she's the one that's searching the house really weird and we don't get back to team pronouns until she says and that's when we noticed the door was locked that's when we noticed truthful people don't typically use words like this and i think with the window when she uses her left hand she's describing some kind of narration and maybe as you enter the room that's where the window is but what's funny is when we experience an emotion or we visualize something, you can watch it on the Tom Reed video when he says it was this massive aircraft and his body and words move together. You'll see her hand getting prepared to come up here before she starts talking about the window. And that's what I call a gestural mismatch. We need to create some kind of a glossary uh, and universalize all these words. But there's a mismatch between spoken word and the actions of the body. That's a big deal. And then she says, oh, my God, there's been a break in. And she was just so scared that she was clinging to Ralph. Uh, I don't think that's happening anymore. And then there's very vivid, vivid detail of how clean Lauren's room was. And no detail about the messy room with the broken window. Not a single piece of description there. And then there's a strange description of the house going one by one by one. Of course, they don't check the closed door first. And, and it's kind of building up to this heroic scene of discovering the crime scene. And I've never met a human being who saw poop in a toilet and thought there's a crime. Like, there may have been a crime committed here. Because <laughs> depends on how it depends on the... Uh... Oh, well, I'm not. That's it. The, the piece, the other piece, guys, that's not coming out here, she'd gotten out of a shower by now and seen blood on the, on the, a bloody footprint on the floor. And that has not been discussed at all in any of this. Not 
it was the poop in the toilet that was the problem for her, not the bloody footprint on the ca- carpet when she got out. And another thing, Chase, I think you're right about that. Trying to look and trying the hero look. Like I, I always go back to Kafka on some of this stuff, but it's that Kafka esque thing. Every man is necessarily the hero of his own story in a nutshell. I th- so I, I, I think you're right there. I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I totally see that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So here's what's, here's the patterns that I'm seeing. Cause at this point we're, we're three into something I know nothing about. And now my analyst's mind is going, what pattern am I starting to see? What's going? So here's a pattern. She's got a lot of eyebrow knitting a lot of the time. That's to signal to us her confusion. Just as Scott was saying, it's now a story about confusion. She does confusion, concern, and then confirmation every time. So do you see how confusing it was? Do you see because of confusion, how I got concerned in this way and started down this action? Do you, do you get why I, I do that? So there's a strong pattern there. The other strong pattern that I'm seeing is that, and, and we were talking earlier about what people's notes look like and here's what my I don't know whether we can see that but here's what my notes look like but seeing that box down there at the bottom of the page yeah three in at the bottom of the page three in I've scrubbed something in a box and it says uh, people who are clean people who are not this is a story for me about people who are clean and people who are not and that, for me now, in my analysis, is the core of the story. It's a, it's, a, it's a theme that's now strong in my mind around this. There are people who are clean, and there are people who are not clean. Now, I don't know what that means, and I don't know whether that causes people to murder or not murder or flush or not flush, but I do know in her story, there's a strong dialectic. People who are clean and people who are not. Uh, and when she then uh, finally gives that idea, I think it's wonderfully clean. She says wonderfully clean, and she does again this smile of terror. So that's interesting that at the end of these um, patterns, she'll usually end with a smile of terror and and maybe as scott says if we slow that down we may see some disdain in there as well what's most interesting for me is she wants us to know that the idea of wonderfully clean uh is is notable and important so certainly it's enforced itself on me so mark here's an interesting thing the deep swallows are at um creeped out by feces yeah. Then there's a swallow, a deep swallow at story correction. Then there's a deep swallow at she was a clean person. Yeah. Along with emotional accessing. Yeah. And then when they get to mirror this door, there's another deep swallow there. So, hmm. Yeah, those are, it's interesting. You're, what you're seeing and that deep swallow are tied tightly together in these places. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, again, micro interview would tell us why. We don't have that luxury. We're just reading secondhand. But yeah, I think that's a great catch. And we see at the end, just one last thing, Meredith's room. Okay, when we get there, the tone and the rhythm completely changes around the way she's been running with this story. Again, I don't know why, but it's notable now around Meredith's room that she starts slowing this down. My guess is that it's a storytelling device. She's building drama around, around this, building interest and drama because my guess is, is we're about to have something revealed and she wants to make sure that we're engaged in her story before she does some kind of reveal around this. That, that's what I got on that. I- I agree. I agree with you, Mark. At the same time, I think what we're seeing there, because I thought about that as well. I think what we're seeing there is she's she's getting close to seeing it, so she's got to be very careful about what she says up to that when they were getting ready to find the, the body. Mm-hmm. They're getting ready when they're getting ready to come onto the crime scene. The whole place is, but the, the specific where the body. So she's having to get. Specific, she's making sure she's slowing down. She starts slowing down about halfway through that. 
because she's making sure everything is where it should be in the story she's told up to this point because you can't change anything. The other stuff you can add on and help them do all that. And, and, but that's not, that's not where the main focus will be. It will be with us, but it won't be with somebody else. So that's what she's doing. Slowing down, making sure each step is where it should be going, where she stepped before. That was, that was my take on that. So we were gathering ourselves and we went back to my apartment and I was already feeling very creeped out. Um, I was like clutching to Raphael, um, and we were looking around and we actually opened Philomena's door and that's when we noticed the, the window was broken. So I immediately thought, oh my God, there's been a break in. And I started running around. I went, I went into the, um, the other bedroom, which was Laura's, mm -hmm. but it was spotless. Like nothing had been touched. Her bedspread was pulled like so wonderfully clean, mm -hmm. um, like a, like a hotel. Like she was a very, she was a clean, clean person, um, which is why it struck me so strongly that in her bathroom of all places, there would be feces left in the toilet. I was like, no, Laura's the clean one. <laughs> so, um, so her bedroom was fine, which struck me as very odd because it's like, if, if someone breaks in, like they're not going to worry about ruffling things up. And indeed, like Philomena's room was ruffled up. There was clothes and things toppled over and drawers pulled open. And then her room was untouched. The main room, like the kitchen and that area where there was a stereo, there was a TV, untouched. Um, my room, which obviously was not as medicinally clean as Laura's, but un like as far as I could see, untouched. And, and then there was Meredith's room. Um, her door was locked. Mm -hmm. And that was strange. Um, is that everybody? Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on. That was great. Mark, that was fabulous. I wrote that down, man. Thank Beautiful. you. Thank you. That's the shit I'm talking about. That's why, <laughs> that's why we have you on here. <laughs> I love the rap. Uh -huh. I love like, the rap. I think Scott and Greg are like animal hunters, like wild animal hunters to go down and get them. I'm the guy that'll shoot them with like a tranquilizer dart and go, you know, figure out the animal, what's wrong with it, how does it work? And then Mark's like the nature photographer of all this, figuring out how they interact with the tribe, their story and all that. There was Meredith's room. Um, her door was locked and that was strange. Um, she didn't normally lock her door. It had happened at various times, but not, it wasn't the usual thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I remember even knocking on it, um, thinking, oh, if it's locked, then Meredith must be inside. I mean, why else, why, like, why would she lock the, like, it's not like we were the type of house where you had to worry about people going into each other's rooms. Like, if you close your door, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember knocking gently and seeing if she would answer and then knocking harder and seeing if she would answer and finally banging on it and being like, Raphael, like, we need to open this door. Like, I don't understand what, if she's not here, like, why would she lock it? And like, I just don't understand. Like, maybe what if something happened like there and you're starting to try to put things together in your mind, like there's there's blood in the in in that bathroom and then there's then there's feces in the toilet. And so like what like first of all, I wasn't able to like try to understand how all of those things fit together. Mm -hmm. And that was even like more disconcerting because it's like I do not know how to make sense of this. This is not something that is very clear to me. I don't even know if Meredith is here, but it's weird to me that her door is locked. Mm -hmm. And so All right. Uh Chase, you want to go first? Sure. We see a lot here, but the most common phrase in this clip is I remember, which is strange. And when she says, and we got to Meredith's door and it was locked, and I thought that was strange. When in Tom's video, when we, we did the UFO, the guy who saw a UFO, when did he say, I saw the UFO and that was strange? It doesn't happen. We, we did a video with an 80-something-year-old woman who we all deemed as truthful, and she told the story, and this is a female, not including, like, I saw this thing, and it, it blinded me, or I saw this thing, and it was unusual. 
So we're starting to see more verbs. Inclusion of verbs can be directly attributable to deception. And that goes back to Dr. James Pennebaker's work. And we also, uh, nobody would say this, if, it's, if the door's locked, she must be inside. So we're not going through this thought process. The door is locked, she's probably in there. She may be doing something that's private for her. And there's lots of repetition of, I remember, there's banging on the door, and this is the first mention we get of Raphael's presence again. So now that the crime scene is about to be exposed, Raphael's back, so there's a witness. I had a witness. I was not alone. There was a witness with me there. And now we're kind of going through an evidence list. So now we're doing what uh, Obama was very, very good at, which is preempting your unconscious objections or objections that are in your head, he preempts them in the language and the conversation. So we're managing perception of the revelation of evidence. And if we're, te- if we're storytelling, this is what we call exposition. So we're setting up, setting up the, the reader or the listener to learn about this, this world that we've created. And there's no accessing to home. And when I say this, I didn't do a whole lot of forensic research, but I went back and I watched a video of her made by her friend of her talking about seeing the naked Michelangelo statue. And this is before any of this occurred. And it's, it's a few minutes long. You can see all the facial movements, the genuine smiles, the eye accessing. And her home is right over here for all of her responses. And almost during this entire interview, she doesn't look that way at all except to recall a few things right at the beginning that I think are, are truthful. And again, we're seeing Mark's trifecta, the Amanda Knox triangle of confusion. What was it? Concern. Concern. And, and then confirmation. confirmation. Yeah. So that's the, the Amanda Knox triangle there. So we're seeing that again. I don't know how to make sense of this. And, I would say I would stake my reputation that this part of the story specifically is prefabricated 100%. Mark, what do you got? <laughs> yeah, lovely. Uh, here's what I noticed most. And, and i got to tell you, I, I rarely do anything around what people might call eye accessing cues or whatever you want to call that. Uh, it's, it's wholly too complex for me. You know, it means you've got to you know, have enough time with somebody to baseline them and be really, I'm not saying it doesn't work, but it's not, it's not, it's not my easiest route. Yet in this situation, I suddenly see her, and by the way, and I'm, I'm severely dyslexic, so I can't even do left and right, and I won't be able to do the reverse of this. So you'll have to work out what I'm talking about and, and look at the images, because I won't be able to tell you left and right. But anyway, I see her, in my mind, now starting to look up, and this direction, a huge amount. When she's talking about, she can't, she can't imagine, in my mind, she can't imagine the circumstances, she can't imagine the circumstances that would create the pattern that she's describing. So she's doing confusion. It's like, I, I can't even imagine why she's searching for, can I create a situation right now that would make, the details that we've got here, tolerable. And somebody would go, oh, I get it. Because of the thing you've just created here, it matches with the details that we have down here. Okay, we'll stop asking questions. We'll back down. I totally get it. I've not seen yet in this story that, that extreme move from, in my mind, up here to down there. I may have got that reversed or whatever. That's just the way my brain does it, okay? You'll have to forgive me around that. I'm just telling you in advance. My brain doesn't do left and right like most other humans on the planet. Okay, so that for me is super noticeable. (laughs) Suddenly I go, what's going on here? Why have we got, why is this happening? Why do you need to create for me some some fantastical reasoning why these events would happen. Do people keep questioning you on this? Or even for you, is it intolerable how this doesn't fit? 
because it doesn't socially fit. It's strange. It's weird. It's creepy. You've told us all this. You show up at the thing, and now it's like, I'm going to try a little bit to open the door. Though everybody's super concerned, and it's weird, and it's crazy, and it's... I'm not going to socially, had you put all this effort in, you'd be like, well, I was just trying to smash down the door as, as much as I could. I mean, who cares about the cost of the lock or the door or, or actually I got in there and there was something going on. I'm like, oh, sorry, excuse me. I just, there was, you know, we just all got a bit worried and it all seemed a bit weird and, and, and creepy and you'd apologize afterwards. There's so little effort now being put in to getting into that room, I would say, given all of those circumstances, that my intellect is going, there's something up here, there's something going on here. I, I, I don't know what at this point, because when I first started looking at this video, I didn't know anything about this. So that, that's the way my mind is, is working uh, on this. Hope that makes sense to everybody. Okay, Greg. Yeah, so I'm going to take one thing you said, Chase, and this is a really good one. She doesn't say, I remember many times. It's the most pronounced thing she says, and it's for a reason. She has not said, I remember at all in this video until now. She has remembered. She's not said, I remember. When they get to the door, she says, I remember. Ding, 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 red flag. Every one of us hear that and are going to jump on it if we're interrogating because why did she suddenly shift to I remember well there's plausible deniability that's what I remember so we immediately jump to that early in the game she shows Duchesne's grief muscle Duchesne called that the grief muscle she and I can do it again Scott she called that, yeah, it's called a dangerous that the thing. Muscle. and she does that when she says the door was not usually locked and then she goes on to say she locked it a few times well, now I wonder, how the hell do you know she locked her door? Were you checking it? I mean, that's a little odd kind of a conversation. And that's also another redirect that takes her down another path. Um, she then says, she also uses the word and so and hides something in here. She says, and Chase, you hit on it a little in the last video. She says, I like a couple of times. She says it six, instead of saying like, 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 when she gets to this nervous moment, she says it 16 times in this short video. That's a big deal. Something shifted in her thinking. And that baseline shift is something I would want to know about. Mark, your eye movement piece, you're dead on. If we go to what you call home here, Chase, and we're recalling, if we go here for visual and we remember wherever we go, and we go to the other side, it means something. And when you people imagine, they often leave their home or whatever you would call recall. And as importantly, she starts to illustrate with her hand behind her head. The first time I've seen it, that's a red flag. Something is changing in the story. I recall, or I remember, eyes moving, like, 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 like. Now, given it's a stressful moment as you get close, and here's the fifth heavy swallow when she talks about the door being locked. Fifth heavy swallow. So now we're building a pattern. We're walking through, and that's something is going on in her head at that moment. So those pieces are all starting to make us Every one of us suspicious just watching. Does it mean she killed us? What it does mean is if she were in the room with us right now, it would be a very different discussion than she's having with this person. Scott? Excellent. Okay, at the very top of this one, that's one more time she's allowing that safe critique. She starts talking about it's strange. She looks down, looks away from, so she didn't get that eye lock going so that person can observe her and see what's going on. Um, and again, uh, she starts those qualifiers of the strangeness of how she doesn't understand what's going on. Then she explains the logic of how she puts together the, the locked room and how the girl, if she would be in there, why is it locked? If she's not in, it just sounds like Captain Kirk from Star Trek. If she's locked, why isn't she in there? This really broken up uh, logic. And you don't think that way. The path, the logical path doesn't take you down that, that road, quote unquote. Then once she, she gently, all this has happened up to this point. She walks in, she sees all the steps, goes back home, gets her boyfriend, all this stuff's happening. And then she gently knocks on the door. You, really? Who's going to gently knock on the door? And then no answer. So I, I knocked a little, a little louder and then I banged on the door and I didn't hear anything. It's, and you, it's at that point you're like, no, 
that's not that's not the, that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. Chase, the, I'm going to ask you that thing now. Talk about how you remove yourself from something. You know, when you say, I, "I'm doing this," but I and you remove yourself from the the statement. Yeah. Talk about that briefly, because I'm going to. I got something for that. So just the word I remember is distancing language because it removes you from telling. And if uh, you're telling a story and you say, I saw, that's one removal because now as a listener, I have to picture you seeing it instead of me experiencing it with you. So um, we might start a story with that. I walked into the house and there was blood everywhere. I didn't say I saw blood everywhere. I'm, I'm, now I'm pulling you in with my experience and then that typically goes away. So anytime we're removing, as far as I know, if I recall, I remember, uh, which are, those are exclusions, but it's still removing us out of the situation. So anytime the person who's witnessing your story is taken out of point of view, it is one removal for All every right. every point of view of removal. In this 90-second clip, she does that 15 times. She moves herself from what's happening 15 times with her not understanding. Not, uh, And I exactly what you're talking about. She moves herself 15 times. And her blink rate, did you get it, Chase, for this? Uh, 39? I got 20 yeah. in a minute. Okay. So, but I could be, I could be wrong that maybe I started where you didn't in the thing. I didn't do it for the whole thing. Just for the, this, the, once she starts this going down the road of separating yourself from everything in that, in that clip. Um, also one thing we, we see that I think is fascinating. She starts talking about how their room, their, their house as well as houses where you don't have to lock your doors because everybody's, you know, it's a safe place. I, if you lock, if you shut your door, we're not going to go in there. That's when you see her head come up and she exposes her neck. Now, this suggests trust. It suggests trust, but it doesn't exhibit trust. What she's doing is by doing this, when you expose your neck, you're exposing your carotid, your whole thing, you reach in and grab it, you can cut it, whatever you're going to do. And humans, their brain, the limbic system, when something's going on, they'll have it, have you protect it because you see the chin go down, the shoulders come up. We talk about that when someone makes, makes a statement and we saw it in some with our Prince Andrew, he would say something that had to come down and, and guard his throat. She's doing this to suggest it, not exhibit it. And she's suggesting it because she wants the person the viewer to believe what she's saying. Trust me. You can trust me. See, I can, she's not exhibiting it. She's, or suggest she's suggesting not exhibiting trust at that point, still trying to create that bond with the, uh, the person watching the interviewer or the observer. Um, then she just keeps going on about how she's confused about why the door is being locked. I could go on. There's, I can do 15 minutes on this thing, but I won't. But that's, that's one thing that, I, that I've seen when somebody wants you to start trusting. The, you see that head go up, and hers comes down almost like a child, or, or her, shoulder, her shoulders go back, and her head comes up, her neck goes up, talking about trust and how we can trust each other so you can trust me, in other words. That's, that was, for me, that was a big, a big flag on that, a big flag on that. There was Meredith's room. Um, her door was locked, and that was strange. Um, she didn't normally lock her door. It had happened at various times, but not, it wasn't the usual thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember even knocking on it, um, thinking, oh, if it's locked, then Meredith must be inside. I mean, why else, why, like, why would she lock the, like, it's not like we were the type of house where you had to worry about people going into each other's rooms. Like, if you close your door, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember knocking gently and seeing if she would answer and then knocking harder and seeing if she would answer and finally banging on it and being like, Raphael, like, we need to open this door. Like, I don't understand if she's not here, like, why would she lock it? And like, I just don't understand. Like, maybe what if something happened like there and you're starting to try to put things together in your mind, like there's there's blood in the in in that bathroom and then there's then there's feces in the toilet. And so like what like, first of all, I wasn't able to like try to understand how all of those things fit together. Mm -hmm. And that was even like more disconcerting because it's like, I do not know how to make sense of this. This is not something that is very clear to me. I don't even know if Meredith is here, but it's weird to me that her door is locked. Mm -hmm. And so. All right, we good? Yeah, that was great. Me That her door is locked. Mm -hmm. And so I asked Raphael to try to kick it in. Indeed, I even tried to like see if I could see into our window through the terrace, but of course I couldn't see anything. 
and um, he tried to kick it in, but you know, especially when you don't know what's going on, like you're not quite sure. You're like tentative, and like he tried twice and it didn't work, um, and so finally. We, he just called his sister, who's a police officer. She recommended calling the police. We called the police. We left the house because I, I was nervous. Like, I just didn't know what to think. And I assumed there was a break-in. Uh, apparently, the person only went through Philomena's room, but why and if there was in her room her camera, like, sitting right there, like, her laptop sitting right there, like, mm -hmm. what did they take? I didn't see anything taken. Um, so I just did not know what to make sense of it. And um, all I knew is it creeped me out. So in this one, one more time, she entrenches herself in her campaign of, I don't understand what's going on here. Mis of, of not just misunderstanding, but not understanding what's happening, what's going on here. And then she talks about how her boyfriend tries to kick the door in. And then he tries two times and it doesn't work. Now, since we were little children and, and we were men, uh, and we're men now. Every man in America, every man that I've ever met would love to kick a door in and, and save a damsel in distress. There's not one. Rookies live for that. You know, it's like you, you, there's nothing you'd love more than to kick a door in and save some girl from, you know, German sex traffickers or something or European sex or something like that. So that's and he gives up after two kicks. Come on, man. No, if you think the girl might be in there, because at that point, when you first get there and you really did check the place, if it went down like it was supposed to, you lock the door. Hey, man, you in there? What the hell? And you to kick. There's no kicking. Hers not kicking. Go, hey, man, are you awake? Whatever. You're th she could be getting raped. There's no telling what's going on. The person could be in there. But at that point, with, if she's so alarmed that we need to get into her, into Meredith, because he's going to go into guy mode and go, let me get the door, baby. He's going to kick the door and, and save the day. That's what he's going to want to do. So what we see in her body language, what we see in her face is a micro expression of contempt. When she says he tried to kick in the door, we see that contempt go up because she thinks he's a wuss too, you know, because he is, because he didn't kick the, he did she tried twice. Now, some of us have been in those gigs where you kick doors in, but, and that headspace is, you know, you kick it until it comes in, until it's open. Because when you start kicking the door, everybody knows something's up that's inside. So you got to go on through. So that 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 really that really irks me. That bothers me about the guy. So she's maybe she's getting ready to get. They're not that tight as a couple or whatever. But she has contempt for him, and I don't know if it's because he couldn't get the door open, or he's such a wuss, or because she doesn't like him in the first place, and that's just part of it that she doesn't like. But that's the micro expression I saw. Because um, she leaves. Um, Let's see. Then she goes outside and see if she can see in from the terrace, knowing that she couldn't. How stupid me. I, I tried to go outside and see. And again, her campaign of, I couldn't figure this out. No, I'm so stupid. I go outside and try to look in the window and I couldn't see. That's what's happening there. And then, um, you yeah, know, they say there's a break in. And the only thing apparently he did was go through this one girl's room. Again, they haven't checked this other girl's. She checks, she checks two bathrooms before she checks and the commodes before she checks on this other girl. The, the, you know, the locked door that she's so concerned about and trying to figure out as she goes through. Um, what uh, I could go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get all, all worked up. Greg, why don't you go? Why don't you sure, go? yeah. She didn't look through the window. Indeed, she looked through the window. That's a weird choice. Yeah. Of words. She's writing a fiction book or something. Here. Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith from... Uh, uh, yeah, from Austin Space, yeah. Yeah, he used to say, Maybe. indeed. Maybe maybe she talks like that. Don't know. But she, these are weird words. And I always say diction matters. Which words you choose are indicators of preparation. There goes my hand moving. is causing the thing to freeze up. So word choice usually is a red flag for you. If something doesn't fit, then you wonder why. That sounds like preparation. Diction matters. Um, she also, her eyes are downright a lot when she's talking about this. And typically you think those are emotional or internal kind of gut conversations, but she's left hand gesturing again as she talks about this. Left hand gesturing and Scott, I mean, uh, Chase, you'll always talk about hemispherical tendencies. I just always say right hand is what a person's normally doing. They use their left hand. It means something. It's a baseline deviation. So I'll let you talk about that in a second. Her left shoulder is also coming up fairly often as she's talking through the story. And finally, she's shaking her head. I don't think she believes half of this. I think for some reason, whatever the story is, this is her trying to convince herself that she's telling you the right thing. Um, but there's body language of disbelief in here. 
all that wrenching of your face as you're talking facts is just a kind of an odd thing. There's an and um, and um, and um going on here as well. So do I believe her? I would be poking awfully hard on the story she's telling. He tried twice and it didn't work is when she's using a left-hand gesture. And then finally, she starts talking about the house. She says nothing was taken. Deep swallow. There's the sixth. Again, might not mean anything, but if they're always around things that don't sound believable in a story or they're around emotion or they're around feces in the toilet and the other person being clean, it gives me insight for how I would talk to this person about, so come on, tell me what your relationship was with Meredith. Did you guys ever fight about, boom, her locking her door, feces in the toilet, whatever? I would walk down that path. It would give me an insight. Chase. I picked up on the Indeed right away. I think that's unusual. And again, if we go back to language profiling, there's a lot of guys who who are, are very good at this. There is a, a famous linguist uh, named Steven Pinker who has done most of the research on this. And he was in coordination with Dr. Pennebaker when writing this book. And there's, I think they've produced around nine studies on this that have proven that an increase in big word uses is an increase in deception and deception language. This is in written and spoken statements, indeed. So I think she says, and of course, I couldn't see anything. So there's no way that I was going to be able, I didn't expect to see anything. So it was just, I'm just throwing that detail into the story. And then she says, you're a little tentative, like he tried twice and it didn't work. And so finally, let's listen to that pronoun again. She says, you, the listener, are a little tentative, which is A, a pronoun shift, which is possibly indicating some deception, and B, another attempt to socialize her story and make you start nodding because she's saying you would be, you would be feeling this way as well. We see that shoulder go up at all the critical points through here. I didn't count how many times she said like. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel has a whole show where he does that on The the Bachelor, where he, he'll go through a whole episode, which is fabulous indeed. And then she winds up saying, finally, he just called his sister. As if it's not a big deal, he just called his sister. And this is starting the process of evidence the discovered evidence perception. How, how am I going to shape how the evidence that's been discovered is going to be perceived? And if there was in her room, like is what she said exactly. And the unusual phrasing, the likes, the ums are the ums when someone's saying that, in, especially in an interrogation context or talking about witnessing a crime, they serve two purposes. Number one, they give you time to think. And this is an unconscious thing. These people who use this aren't reading a book, how to lie to interrogators for dummies. This is a natural thing that we do. The second thing they do is prevent you from being interrupted. If I know this guy's going to cut a hole in my story, or I know I've just said a lie and I'm about to keep going on the story, I need to keep going so that I can't be interrupted and questioned about this thing. So I think those are the two ways that we use those things. And at the end, she said, it creeped me out. Again, another use of this, it really creeped me out. And I would say that nothing suggests honesty here. You know, Chase, here's another thing. When you say, um, and you're fishing for resonance, it's a good test, right? I'm not going to go a step further until I'm sure you're still synced. Yeah. Great opportunity. And that's all I got. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Perfect. So, uh, you know, Scott puts these video files in the Dropbox. You go in there. First two videos, I'm like, why are we watching this? I mean, I don't know. What's... I'm fairly indifferent to what's going on. By the third one, I'm like, okay, this is kind of interesting because, you know, there's people who are clean and there's people who are not. And I'm now kind of going, okay, I, I think I understand the underlying idea behind this story. We get to video four 
and I'm kind of like, oh, this is this is now getting a bit disjointed, and and I'm not quite. This doesn't make any kind of social sense, and and I'm now getting. I'm now getting uh, confused as to why there's so much confusion in the story. We get to the fifth one and I'm like, oh, okay, now, now we've got a problem. Now we have a real problem. And my real problem here is the double eye roll. Two eye, we've never seen a roll arise before. We've never seen that signal of disdain. The double eye roll on to see if I could see in this idea of... Um, uh, going and looking in to, which would seem, you know, if you, if you're, so, so I, I don't understand where the, where, where the, how, where the, the flat or the house or whatever is situated, but it sounds like it would be possible to look, to look through. Okay. It'd be possible to look through. And my guess is, is somebody at some point had said, did you not just, you know, go and have a look through the, through the window. Okay. I think she knows at this point that her fo- her story is a total rat and it's falling to bits and she's she's smelling her own rat. She isn't doing the, the nose wrinkle of disdain, but she's doing the eye roll double of disdain. I would say to say, you idiot, now you, this totally lets down your story. You've got a real problem. She seems to have a real problem with looking through and not getting the data that everybody thinks you should be able to get. She's got a big problem with it because uh, there's a real gap there, I believe. It was at this point that I started getting really interested in this story going, okay, so what comes next? What comes next? Because now it's falling apart and she's just told me. At this point, it totally falls apart. And disdain is interesting because it's not only about the individual, it, it has social implications. So I would suggest her mind is going, they're not going to buy this. Come on, you idiot. They're not going to buy the idea of you couldn't, you didn't try and look through the window or you didn't see something earlier. There's a massive gap in the story there. And then afterwards... Uh, it's either, I, haven't, I only saw it once, I didn't go back on it, didn't have time. It's either a push or grooming. I think either way, it has implications, whether it's she's going more distaste or, look, I, I look really good, so you should, you should buy my story. I'm not sure <laughs> which one it is. Why don't you, as the viewer, go back and, and tell me in the comments whether it was a, a push of distaste or a grooming gesture that said, look how nice I look. Please don't notice that I just did a double eye roll around this. There's my take on this. I'm now interested in the other videos. You know what's funny, Mark, is when you say that, when you're doing it for grooming, you don't look away. Okay. She breaks eye contact. Okay. Good one. All right. right. Where were, Are you going to say something, Chase? Yeah. What do you guys have for a percentage of truth? Yeah. Uh, I'll go first. I think the percentage truth is about, uh, oh man, it's really low. It's really, really low, really low. And it's, it's easy for me to say, oh, it's, you know, 99%, you know, deception. But the truth part of it, I'm getting maybe 20%. And, and I'm adding the parts where she left and came back, those kind of things. 20, 23%. I'm going to say 23% truth. I'm going to give it 25%. And then I'll, and the rest of it, I think, is is deceptive. I'm Greg, gonna go with sixteen point uh, three eight. Yeah. Oh, three eight. <laughs> I love your percentage. Nicely so for put. me, I, I read the case. This is a mess. There is so much stuff going on. And finally, there's a guy convicted who went to short trial, said he did the murder, and there's a lot of DNA evidence and that kind of thing. I don't know what it means, but I certainly will tell you that if I were interrogating this person, it would be a rough, rough rough ride and maybe she just has the most unfortunate body language of anyone I've ever met but she looks about 25 percent believable Mark what about you yeah for me you know it would depend on what segment we're looking at and I think that's the interesting thing is to go look obviously the more you see of anything 
the more data you get, essentially the more intelligent you can be around the decisions that you're making. Now, obviously, there's a window of opportunity. You get too much data, and now the brain is overwhelmed, and it, and it can't make a, make a choice. If we were just going on the first two videos, I would be relatively indifferent to this and be going, okay, so a murder apparently went on, but it, it just looks like somebody recounting a story quite well. Who really cares? Let's just say they're being relatively honest. And there's a, there's a bit of a problem with some of the distasteful elements in the story. I would go, don't mistake that for lying. You know, they just, you know, they didn't like feces in the toilet. That's all. But then by the time we get to the third and the fourth and the fifth, it's really reversed for me. So now I'm really engaged. Now I'm really interested in this. And, and because of those, that double eye roll in that, I'm going for like, you've, you've, you're, there's something you're not telling me. There's, so I'm going like 100% liar <laughs> on that. Now look, look how, how that reversal has happened. So I've got to take in more information around this, else I'm going to convict somebody on, on one-fifth of, of the video that we've seen. So I'm interested in, uh, in seeing more. So your story, Mark, went from clean person to dirty person. Well, it went from indifference to interest. And, and, and certainly, like I, like, I would give you the benefit of the doubt on one and, one and two because I'm not getting enough heat to kind, of, to kind of go, I'd like to investigate this more. Now, if it were my job... To in, then, then I'd lay on the heat. But as, a, as an idle, uh, um, uh, educated expert viewer, notice what has to happen for me to go, there's something going on here, and get Likewise. really engaged in this. Same you know? here. Yeah. Oh, how, mind, we're not saying whether she's guilty or not. That's we're, right. None of us are calling her a murder. What that's we're right. doing is analyzing the statement, the story, the process, the interview, perhaps, and whether or not that those are truthful and natural or real. So guilty knowledge, I think, is there. Guilt, mm -hmm. we have no idea. That's not, our, that's not what we're here for. Guys, I, I would say the same. This is a guilty knowledge test for me. If I walk down six times, she swallows deeply. If I look at she only says, I remember one time, and it's as they're opening the door – there, those are big red flags. There's a lot of other little nuance and subtle things here. And people can make mistakes. But if you wonder why the police interrogators were climbing in your shorts, we're showing you why the police interrogators were climbing in your shorts. That doesn't mean that she kills someone. It simply means that they had the same suspicion that we have watching her body language. Yeah. All right. Good. All right. Well, then uh, there's another inference in the can. Let's uh, get ready for part two yeah, thanks guys for making for, this for work yeah yeah, that yeah. Around. yeah. So is this mic is this mic good up here in this spot right here is no it still no put it back down okay hold on it's, like it's, a, it's a little it's a little warm in here it's, now you sound like a lifelong smoker yeah 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 hold on one second <laughs> <laughs> that's funny oh that's better that's funny Okay. That's much better. You know what, though? I'm ready to go when you guys are. That, that's, I wouldn't do that to you, man. That's rude. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Look what Scott's got. got nothing. Oh, man. Nothing. Yeah, Mark, We've you all... and I are the straight guys for this. Yeah, yeah. We're... We're just I've late. been waiting on your retaliation, Mr. Hughes. <laughs> As you can see, I've prepared. This is only the beginning. Beginning. <laughs> beginning? <laughs> That's good, though. Dang it. Where'd you get that? Why that picture? Hottie language, Hottie tactics language. Dot com. That's funny. Oh, I got it. I got it. Oh, Hottie language tactics. Okay. 